So what is IPM? It's integrated pest management, right? And you probably do this already. Uh, most gardeners and growers I know do do facets of IPM. They just may not think of it as um, practicing uh, integrated pest management. Um, so basically it's a solid foundation in preventative measures and that's what this triangle kind of um, alludes to is that at the bottom that's where you're going to start, right? That's your foundation. So preventative measures and that includes our cultural controls and I'll go over briefly what those are, biological controls, mechanical and physical controls and then as a last resort uh, chemical controls. But basically part of IPM is scouting regularly and checking it out, going out in your garden, you know, daily, every other day, as often as you can, and making sure that programs don't, or problems don't arise without your knowledge. All of these measures besides chemical are preventative, and so these are all things that you're going to do before you have a problem, right? Spraying is curative. It's after, typically after you have a problem, a lot of times you're going to go in with a chemical or after you detect the problem, um, you'll go in with a chemical, chemical and apply at that point. Um, but IPM, or integrated pest management, is concerned with preventative measures. So starting at the very bottom, we talk about cultural controls. These are, again, something that we do before we have an issue. Grow the healthiest plant you can, right? That goes without saying. And part of that, I believe, is getting a soil test and knowing what your soil says, how much fertilizer you need, what type, um, and doing that regularly. Um, in extension, I would tell people every three to five years, you need to be doing a soil test. It's cheap and it'll help you know where you're at as far as nutrients are concerned. Another part of cultural control is basically altering the environment to make it unsuitable for pests. And so how do we do that? Well, sanitation. Even if you don't know what a disease or a blemish is on that leaf, a lot of time you're going out there and you're picking it off and you're throwing it away, right? So you don't wanna let those diseased leaves lie. Crop rotation, of course, is very important. Breaking that pest cycle, kind of fooling those pests that are hanging out there, waiting to infest your next crop. Tillage, of course, can also help. Turning under that debris can help get rid of um, certain pests. Altering your planting dates, so planting sooner or later to avoid that window when those pests are active. Planting resistant varieties is also really important, especially if you know every year you have this certain disease. Now, resistance doesn't mean immunity. Eventually, those resistant varieties may not be resistant anymore, but it's a good place to start. And then on a larger scale, you can do trap harvesting, or I'm sorry, strip harvesting or trap cropping. And so strip harvesting, they do it a lot in alfalfa to where they're only um, harvesting one section at a time. And that allows the rest of that field to still be available for any of those um, good and sometimes bad bugs that are there, right? So cool season vegetable varieties. I looked through several different fact sheets. I looked through our fact sheets. I looked through Texas A&M. I looked through other universities that share a border with Oklahoma to look at some of their most common um, vegetable varieties. And I put them on that sheet for you there if you're interested in knowing some of the ones that performed the best in trials and in variety trials. Jim wanted me to talk a little bit about cool season veggies. And so these are some that I saw over Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas A&M, these are the varieties that I kept seeing repeated. And so I feel like in those broad areas of different types of climate, these are the ones that we could probably experiment with and do, um, you know, do some trials here in Oklahoma. Um, so if you want some ideas of new varieties, these might be some to try. Um, maybe that you haven't heard of. There's some All-American selections up there as well. So we've done a little bit of vegetable varieties, but there's not usually a lot of push or funding or grant funding for just doing variety trials. And so a lot of times um, the varieties that may be out there, yeah, there might be some that have some good resistance to certain diseases that we see, um, but there may not be a whole lot of trials going on. Our Amer All-American selections is really well. Um, done, but um, it's, well, as far as research concerned, a lot of times that's not a huge push. So um, some of the data can be outdated sometimes. So the next step of our pyramid, we talked about cultural controls. We're gonna soil test, we're gonna till where it's appropriate. Um, we're gonna grow the healthiest plants that we can. We're gonna choose the resistant varieties if we have a problem with mildews or molds or anything like that. We're gonna find some varieties that are suitable to where we're growing. My bailiwick is biological control, and so using good bugs to kill bad bugs. That's what I like to do, because I like bugs. So biological control concerns the three Ps, and the three Ps are pathogens, parasitoids, and predators. And so that's what we use against these pests um, to help manage them. And again, this is a preventative measure because you don't want to wait until you have an explosion of a pest to do something about it, especially with biological control. Biological control works really well at low density. 
Um, so you're looking at employing something before you actually have the problem. Maybe it's a problem you know you're going to have. Um, so it's increasing the numbers of beneficial insects to prey on pest insects. And a lot of times we do this by purchasing them. So you can purchase parasitoids, you can purchase lady beetles, you can purchase different types of flies, um, you can purchase microbial insecticides, um, or you can create a habitat that's beneficial to them. And so it's two different sides of biological control. Um, so when you purchase and buy those, that's caused called augmentative biological control because you're augmenting what's already there or what may not be there. And then conservation biocontrol is actually um, creating habitat, providing food or shelter for those insects that may be in the environment but may not be hanging around. And so just creating a favorable habitat for them. Um, and then the microbials, this a lot of times is applied like a dust or a spray, just like a chemical, but it happens to be a fungus or a virus or a bacteria that attacks a certain type of insect and kills them. And there's a couple that I'll, that I'll go over um, here in a little bit. So when you're talking about providing shelter or food for beneficial insects, there's several different ways to do it. And so we can talk about our vertebrate, in, our vertebrate uh, biological controls. So birds, bats, putting up bat boxes, things like that. Um, you can put up butterfly boxes if you want, but they're probably not going to do. They might do the opposite because a lot of butterflies and moths are actually bad for our plants, right? Um, but bee boxes, um, bat boxes are a good idea. Bee boxes are great because they help with the native bees, um, maybe the solitary bees that aren't swarmers. And those actually do about 80% or more of our pollination over what you would think the European honeybee would do. And then insectary plants. And these are plants that we can plant within a row, around a row, uh, in the perimeter. Uh, there's lots of studies going on about placement and where those need to be within those vegetable rows to do a good job. But they provide shelter or food or pollen for parasitoids, for predators. It causes them to hang around a little bit longer and prey on those insects that you have on your plants. Um, and so if you're looking at purchasing biological controls, there's several insectaries online. Um, but the ones that I feel are most reputable are Coppert, BioLine, and BioBest. Um, so if you are looking to purchase biocontrols, um, you can go through those uh, sources if you like. And here's a picture of these bee boxes. So this is, a, this is a bat box. These are bee boxes. And the idea is to provide them several different sizes of cylinders. So you can use your drill bit. You can drill into some wood that you have laying around. You can um, slice down some bamboo sticks and congregate those together. What this does is this gives a place for those bees to lay eggs over the winter. And then they will come out and, and help you do um, your pest control, right, after they, they um, come out. It's another reason why I don't tell people to clean out their garden, like their ornamental garden, um, until the first of the year. Because a lot of times when you have those grass stems, those bees will get down in there and overwinter that way too. Um, so wait until spring to clean out your garden, right? Let that stuff stay there. Um, so this was at, this is actually in Stillwater here on the right at the Insect Adventure. They have this right outside the door to keep all their native bees around. So switching to conservation biocontrol and types of plants, insectary type plants. And these are just some of the more common ones I pulled out of a fact sheet that I also have in the back. And it says conservation controls for the landscape, um, but it also transfers into vegetable plants. And so some of the common things that I see in early season, cross vine, which is a perennial, it gets really big, nice flowers. Hummingbirds love it. It sets a lot of nectar and pollen, so it would be good for those predators and parasitoids that are coming in. Wild red columbine, showy evening prim primrose. And then I like to say, if you've got some brassicas, let them bolt, because the parasitoids love those flowers. Okay, so if you've got greens or brassicas, go ahead and let a couple of those plants flower and your parasitoids and predators will hang around a little bit longer because they've got a food source. Even though they lay eggs inside that pest, they're actually feeding on pollen. So mid-season, we've got lance leaf coreopsis and other primrose, bee balm or monarda. It's a very common one to bring in good predators and good parasitoids. Lead plant, Mexican hat, purple comb flower, autumn sage. All of these things are very common. You can find them at your nursery and garden center. A lot of times you can buy them as seed. And so again, planting some of these things in and around your vegetable plots will help bring in those good guys. And then late season, you've got hyssop, ironweed, goldenrod, maximilian sunflower. And when you think of these, I mean, they're true showy plants, right? And so those pollinators really do come in 
and feed on those and then have a tendency to, to eat your other things that you don't want. And again, on the other side, the late season, if you do a fall garden, you can leave some of those brassicas to bolt. Okay. So I also have a fact sheet on microbial insecticides in the back if you want more information. But again, a lot of these are sprayed like a chemical, okay? but they happen to be a naturally occurring um, microbial. Two of the most common used in horticulture are Mycotrol and Botanigard. These are actually a formulation of Bavaria bassiana, which is a fungus, and you can see that here. This is a fuzzy little aphid that's got fungus growing all over it. Okay, so that's the Bavaria um, that you can actually spray. It's, it's similar in, well, it's similar to Bt because it's found in the soil. It's a bacteria found in the soil. So if you're familiar with Bt, it's the same same idea. That's readily available, might be a little pricey, um, but it will affect thrips, white flies, aphids, and beetles. And then the one that you guys are probably most familiar with as a microbial is Bt, right? So thuricide, dipel dust, both of those are microbial. Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacteria found in the soil. And it's toxic to butterfly and moth caterpillars, so your cabbage loopers, um, a lot of your other lepidopteran pests, um, it will affect those. Um, but it's very specific to those types of caterpillars. So you have to make sure if you see a really random one that maybe you're not familiar with, make sure you get it identified properly um, because you can apply all the BT in the world to a soft fly and it won't kill it, okay? Um, and then there is a strain as well for flies. So for mosquito problems and fungus gnats, um, you can find a BT strain for that as well. Metarhizium is one that I don't think is very common on the market yet. I know Dr. Rebeck was doing some tests on different beetles in turf, but it is one that's showing promise that there's a lot of research going on right now that's specific to beetles. And so um, that would be another microbial potentially um, in the future. And then nematodes are kind of considered, they're kind of lumped in with our plant path people, plant pathology. And so there are a couple of nematode strains you've probably heard of, no low bait. If you've heard of no low bait, that is a microbial, a nematode that affects grasshoppers. Okay, so no lobate or nosema, and then variomorpha is another one um, that affects certain butterflies, moths, and grasshoppers. But we typically reach for the BT when we have bot butterflies and moths, right? So again, planting those plants to draw these guys in. You probably never even know they're there. They don't want to sting you. They could care less about you, okay? They want those aphids. So you can purchase them, plant those plants to draw these guys in. Um, how many aphids a day do you think a ladybug can consume? Quite a few? 60, 70 maybe? Parasitoid can lay up to 300 eggs in, a day, in its lifetime, which is usually a couple days. Okay. So yes, ladybugs and parasitoids both have their, their pros and cons, right? Um, because with the aphids, they're going to swell up. You're going to see them, right? You're going to know. Um, that they're parasitizing those aphids. With the ladybugs, you're not going to have that evidence. So that's good and a bad thing, right? Some people might see the mummies and not know what they are and not know that that's basically like a built-in biocontrol, right? We like seeing aphid mummies. Um, but again, with the ladybugs, it might be hard to gauge how much they're doing because they consume that whole pest. Okay, so there are pros and cons to everything. How do we do mechanical and physical controls? We're moving up that pyramid. We're at the third section now. And these are physical removal by hand, right? Um, or weeding or hoeing or like I like to do, squishing those insects, right? Picking them off and squishing them between my finger. Feeling that really nice pop, satisfactory. Um, but you can also use different types of films like kaolin clay, which is showed here in these, at this apple orchard. You can see that white one's been sprayed. The other one hasn't. It creates kind of a barrier that's undesirable to certain insects or pathogens sometimes. And then row covers or low tunnels, whatever you want to call them, that creates that barrier to keep those insects out. And then mechanically removing pests. So you've got, there are actually vacuums that people use. Um, the thing with the vacuum is though, you're sucking up good and bad. Right, so that's a consideration. Hand picking, and then of course, there's not really any great um, chemical for um, organic weed control, right? It falls down to a lot of labor or using a mulch. Um, and so that's a consideration there as well for mechanical and exclusion. A lot of us might have had a change of heart over, I don't know, the past couple of years or so, but this used to be the first thing we went to. We'll spray first and think about everything else later, right? And now we're doing more steps to prevent having to spray. And so a chemical application is typically, like I said, curative. 
Um, you've got organic or traditional pesticides that you can use. Just because it's organic doesn't mean it's not a chemical. It's still a chemical, right? Water's a chemical. Um, and again, you want to rotate your chemicals, um, ideally every three times you spray it, right? Change the group number. And you might say, what's that group number? Well, here's all the common insecticides that we can use in vegetables, and there's the group number beside them. Traditional, if you've been using acetamiprid for five or six sprays, you might want to choose carbaryl, which is a different group, right? A one versus a four versus a three. Okay, so you want to rotate out of these chemical groups often. When you don't is when you start to see resistance, okay, and you start to see issues that are not being taken care of even though you're spraying the same thing that took care of it last time, okay? So being smart about spraying those insecticides. Mm -hmm.